Um, do you favor a timetable for American troops to withdraw from Iraq? And if so, what is that timetable? Dr. Burner first. I do favor a timetable. We need to make it clear that we are going to responsibly end the war in Iraq and bring our troops and our dollars home safely. We're currently spending about $10 billion a month in Iraq. The 8th Congressional District alone has spent two and a half billion dollars on the war in Iraq. That's a lot of schools, a lot of bridges, a lot of businesses that won't be started because they didn't have the money. Two and a half billion dollars for this congressional district alone. It's long past time for us to say to the countries in the region, okay, you're going to have to take responsibility for being stabilizing rather than destabilizing influences, for saying to the Iraqi government, you have to take responsibility for your own country. You have to step up and engage in the reconstruction process. You have to start paying for the reconstruction process. You have to, to deal with your own population. And we can do that. Our generals are telling us that we can safely remove our troops at the rate of about one brigade a month. We have roughly 16 combat brigades there and another four non-combat brigades there. So the timeline that I would propose, based on what our military commanders are telling us, is roughly that 20-month period they're telling us we can do it in safely. All right, Congressman. Well, first of all, just to go back to the previous question, I have never been for moving anyone's Social Security payments uh, into the stock market. This is, uh, I have just said, and I will say again, the money would be a personal account inside the Social Security system. So I just wanted to clarify that. Uh, I've been to Iraq, I've been to Afghanistan, I've been to Pakistan, I've met with President Karzai, I've met with General McKiernan, who is in commander of the um, uh, ISAF troops, uh, the NATO troops in Iraq. I have met with uh, the Prime Minister uh, Ghilani in uh, Pakistan, and um, I've met with General Petraeus and Ambassador Crocker. I'm getting firsthand information from those people who are intimately involved with what's happening in the Middle East. Uh, the reason that my opponent can say, you know, it's in 20 months we can begin to look at, that would be a date that we might be able to take advantage of to having our troops out of Iraq, is that the surge has worked. And benefiting off of uh, the success of the surge, my opponent now recommends that in 20 months we can have troops out of Iraq. Well, I would agree with her that that might be a time frame, but I'm not the general and I'm not going to say that I want the troops out of there in 20 months or 16 months or 15 months. That has to be determined by the people who on the ground who are, who are making those decisions and intimately involved in the intel and the activity of our troops in those countries where we're at war. And I do agree that more resources need to be sent to Af Afghanistan. That's a request from President Karzai and also from General McKiernan. A quick follow-up on the issue of Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, as we know that there are reports this week that Afghanistan is spiraling downward and uh, becoming a crisis situation, uh, particularly with, Al with the Taliban and, and uh, Al-Qaeda there. But I'm wondering, do you believe that Iraq is still the most important front in the battle against terrorism, or is it Afghanistan? Well, go ahead, go to me. I, I believe that they're both equally critical. I, I think that we've made great progress. I know we have made great, great progress uh, in Iraq. As I said, I've been there uh, pre-surge and post-surge and seen the improvements there. Um, and, the, and the critical uh, turning point uh, was when uh, the people of Iraq themselves, working with others, deciding that they no longer wanted violence in their, in their country and in their communities, worked with the Iraqi Police Department, the Iraqi Army, and the U.S. and other coalition forces there in identifying those terrorists in their neighborhoods and moving them out. So now what we have is an area, we take control of a neighborhood, we protect the neighborhood, we reconstruct in, in, in Iraq, the government is strong, the Army is beginning to become strong, their police department is strong, I've met with police chiefs in, in uh, Baghdad, and we can do the same thing in Iraq with a little bit different twist to it because the, the, the makeup of the community is, is much different than in Iraq. All right. Go ahead, you have one minute. We took our eye off the real threat when we went into Iraq because the real threat is and has always been in those mountains between Pakistan and Afghanistan. That's where Al-Qaeda was strong. That's where bin Laden attacked us from. And, you know, to have gone into Iraq and made ourselves weaker and weaker 
our ability to do anything militarily, diplomatically, even economically, is substantially less now than it was before we went in six years ago. At the same time that the threat, the very real threat, from Afghanistan is growing, is the epitome of recklessness and foolhardiness. We have to deal with the real threat in Afghanistan, and the policies of this administration and Congressman Reichert have made that much harder for us to do. All right, so many issues, so little time, but I do want to get at least to uh, one issue regarding the environment, and also uh, this was a uh, question that was sent to us by a viewer from uh, Dr. Jonathan Harrington on Mercer Island, in which he asks, are you committed to passing uh, federal legislation that includes mandatory reductions in greenhouse gas emissions by industry with the eventual goal of reducing overall emissions by at least 20 percent below current levels by 2020, 80 percent below 1990 levels by uh, 2050. And I believe it's uh, Darcy Bernie first. Yes. The threat posed to us by global climate change is very real and caused by human activity and we need to address it. I want my five-year-old to be able to live in a world in which um, you know, we still have the species of trees. We don't have global famines. We don't have sea levels rising. I, went, um, I spent many of my child, much of my childhood, many summers, down at Mount Rainier National Park. My dad um, was a public school teacher for much of my childhood, and he would spend summers as a park ranger there. And I remember hiking up to see the Carbon Glacier and how it was a relatively short hike when I was a kid. We've watched as chunks of that glacier that were thousands of years old have fallen into the Carbon River and vanished. And now the length of the hike is so long I can't take my five-year-old son to go see it, or couldn't if the trails were in decent repair, which they aren't because we don't have the federal money to repair those trails. Um, we have to address this problem. I am committed to doing what it's going to take. But we can do that in a way that makes us stronger here in Washington State and here in the 8th Congressional District by developing new clean energy sources, um, using the technologies that our entrepreneurs and innovators are, are creating, and creating good jobs that will stay here. I am completely committed to doing that, and we can do that if we have a Congress that's willing to lead the way. Congressman. Well, there are currently two bills uh, in Congress that address uh, the issues that uh, your uh, email uh, question uh, addresses. One is the Waxman bill, the other is the Gilchrist bill. And I am on uh, the Gilchrist bill, which does the things uh, that uh, your, uh, your listener eventually tonight will, will, uh, will hear. So I do agree that uh, global warming uh, is occurring that it is man-made. I do agree that things need to be done now. Uh, I have been a part of action in Congress that um, has, has uh, supported bills, supported legislation, supported amendments to cap and trade, to uh, lower CAFE standards, to preserve wilderness areas here in, in our own uh, uh, state. Um, I was one of the co-sponsors of uh, Wild Sky. I have uh, sponsored my own bill, uh, Alpine Lakes Wilderness Bill, which um, I'm hoping to move uh, next year as more and more Democrats come to support it. But uh, I, I think we all want to preserve uh, our, our pristine Northwest uh, greenery and protect our environment for our children and our grandchildren. And, uh, and, and I have, I think, uh, proven myself in that arena. Um, in, in fact, uh, the PI, uh, of course, today endorsed me and recognizes my efforts there. And the League of Conservation Voters has recognized my efforts there and given me a score of 85, which is higher than some Democrats in our own delegation. So I, I don't think anyone can question my commitment to the okay. environment. Thank you, Congressman. All right, we have now reached uh, the end, or just about the end. I'm going to give you time to each make a closing statement, 90 seconds. Darcy Berner, you go first. On July 1st of this year, my family faced the biggest crisis that we've ever faced, a house burned down. When my five-year-old son, Henry, came into my room and said, Mommy, the house is on fire, I made a pact with God. Let me get my family out of here, and you can have everything else. <clears throat> and we lost everything we had. But I learned on July 1st that you can not only face catastrophe, you can face it and move through it. 
I was reminded of how important my family and my community are and how much we can overcome when we work together. This is a country where everyone in it is facing a crisis right now. Lost jobs, lost retirements, an economy in turmoil. It's a crisis that can shake our faith in ourselves and in our government. But we can get through this. We must change. And we can change if we change the people we send to Congress. We can, if we make the changes I know we have to make, turn our hopes into reality. All right, Congressman, you have the final word. Thank you very much. Uh, again, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure uh, to be here and, and uh, answer uh, questions and respond to concerns and issues. And thank you for having us again, Enrique, and, and uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, you know, I, I could talk, uh, I, I'm 58 years old, <laughs> and uh, I've had a lot of life experiences. Um, I think most people know I grew up uh, in a family, um, the oldest of seven kids, and struggled quite a bit. A home that uh, was uh, torn apart by domestic violence, um, who struggled uh, through that, um, struggled through the loss of, of knowing what it feels like to lose partners in the line of duty, uh, knowing what it likes to put my life on the line, knowing what it is like to make tough decisions, life and death decisions, knowing what it's like to work day and night, day and night on uh, a project, on a case where you know people, people's lives are at stake. I bring that energy, I bring that compassion, I bring that understanding to Congress. Uh, my investigative background uh, is one thing, to research and, 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 and seek out the answers and the facts to problems and make decisions based on fact. But my ability to work with people, to bring people together and find consensus and the people who have answers. That's the thing we need in Congress and that's why I've been successful in Congress. And I appreciate the opportunity to serve and ask for your vote again. Thank you very much. Thank you both uh, for being here, for taking the time to answer our questions. And uh, we'd like to uh, thank our audience that uh, stood by, so civil, so quiet. Uh, and they can give a round of applause to the candidates here for it. Thank you all for joining us uh, for this debate on the uh, 8th Congressional District. If you'd like more information about election 2008, just go to kcts9.org. We have an election page there with all the issues, in the 8th Congressional District, as well as the governor's race and other issues that are going on in uh, this election season. I'm Enrique Cerna. Thank you very much for joining us. We'll see you next time. Local production and broadcast of KCTS 9 Connects with Enrique Cerna is made possible in part by a major grant from the Floyd and Dolores Jones Foundation and by the Seattle Post Intelligencer and by KCTS 9 members. Become a member today by going to kcts9.org. Thank you.